to try to understand better some we have been going around interviewing people and one of the ways the, the way in which we've been really focused on this is is, is focusing in on individual people's history, their life, their, their family, the things that they've done. What we're concerned with are issues of leadership. What makes, how do people like yourself and you need a Blackwell and L.C. Dorsey and people up in, in, the, in the mountains of Kentucky who grew up in these local communities, how do they emerge to take, play leadership roles on a whole variety of these issues? And that's one of the concerns that we're doing. So that we're interested in. So we're trying to focus on people's individual stories as much as possible, and then out of that we'll find a lot of other stuff. So what we'd like to do today is to, is to have you talk uh, about your life, and in some ways just in a very autobiographical way, uh, which I know you can do because I've read some stuff that you've already written. So, and, and let us, you know, kind of interject questions here. We can, we'll kind of work our way up through some of your life experiences and then get to uh, the 60s, the, the impact of the civil rights movement, and then move into some of the war on poverty, because you were a really critical player in moving the civil rights movement in the direction of economic issues. Uh, and so that's an important transition that we really need to understand. Uh, so why don't, we, why don't we go ahead and get started? I, I guess what some, some, some of what we like, we've been doing this with everybody to try to understand something about their childhoods and their backgrounds is maybe you could talk a little bit about your, your family, your parents, uh, if you knew your grandparents, where you grew up and what life was like in, the, in your early years. Well, I was born on a plantation, Flowers Brothers Plantation, right outside of Clarksdale in, in Coahoma County. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a tenant farmer. <clears throat> my father, my mother, my sister and me uh, lived there on, on the farm uh, until I was around seven. During that period, uh, when I was around five or six, my father had somehow heard about a, a uh, activity, an institution in Alabama pretty well geared toward black boys. And if they could get there, I, he, they could be taught uh, a trade, uh, a vocational opportunity. So my father went over to Tuskegee and studied under the Booker T. Washington operation mm -hmm. and became a shoe cobbler. And he, after he spent a year there in that activity, when he came back, to Mississippi, there was the about the time that I was beginning to go to school and these kinds of things. And mm -hmm. school situation in the county was not at all as uh, my parents would have hoped it to be, I guess. And, and one of the early things that that uh, came up in the crisis was I was sensitive to the fact that. That at the time that I began to go to school, that black kids went to school five months a year. White kids went seven. And those of us who lived on the plantation had a common relationship uh, because uh, we all worked in the fields. We chopped and picked the cotton and the corn and whatever was there. But there was this uh, difference with regard to the school year for white children and black children and I was very much uh, upset by that as, as, as I remember uh, the situation and I kept asking my mama why the little young white boy I knew Randolph Smith was why did he uh, go to school seven months and I couldn't go but five so we that argue, that questioning went on for quite some time. And I remember finally, you know, my mother was not an educated person. She'd probably gone to sixth or seventh grade, but it had no psychology or philosophy and all, you know, these courses in school. And she, but she, black parents had to deal with these kinds of questions from their children, uh, just like 
other parents did regardless of their circumstances. So I can remember very well, she, she called me one day when I was talking about white kids going to school, seven months and blacks going five. You know, what made that different? So she finally told me, she said, come here and say, look, you my boy. You don't need but five. <laughs> they ain't smart as you, they got to have seven. <laughs> <laughs> and she psyched me, so I guess that became a, uh, in, uh, a instrument uh, by which uh, oh, character was begun to be molded in that whole, all, that whole thing. Did you know uh, your grandparents at all? Had your had your parents lived in this part of Mississippi for a number yeah, of years? Yeah, my my grandparent, my grandfather, I knew him, mm -hmm. and he lived with us for a while before he died. Mm -hmm. And of course, he too was uh, a farmer by background. He mm -hmm. had uh, the the talents of, of chopping cotton, picking cotton, and this was all that he had done, you know, for a living. Mm -hmm. Was there, an ex did you have an extended family? Did you, did your mother, father, have brothers and sisters, did you? No, I had just one sister, huh. had one sister. How about your parents? Did they have, did you have aunts and uncles that lived around too, or? No, my mother had sisters, but they lived in other parts of the state, in Mississippi, yes, mm -hmm. but they were not a part of what we would call mm -hmm. an extended family, generally. All of the people in the neighborhood that I lived in was pretty much an extended family because uh, any time I did right or wrong and my mom and papa was not immediately there, uh, they got to work and I was, mm -hmm. I, I got as many whippings about things I did when they weren't there as I did mm -hmm. <laughs> things they saw me do. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole adult community sort of participated in in helping raise children. Mm -hmm. How did your, uh, I mean this is, I mentioned in, in how your father, I mean that's a big big step to go away as an, uh, you know. As well, a yes, father. and he was very well, let's say to some degree, appreciated by the whole community that he had uh, made that step to try to improve himself as well as his economic condition is. Well, it was his family. When he came back from Tuskegee, uh, about two years after that, we moved from the plantation into the community of Clarksdale, mm -hmm. where uh, the school system was better. I thought it was good, you know, at that time. Frankly, they began to purchase a home uh, on the same street that the school where black kids went. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, was and that sort of was intimidating too because that was the playground for black children and any time my mama wanted me she always had to do go to the front door and hop <laughs> and, uh, you know I was always uh, you know I was vulnerable because uh -huh. of the closeness that we lived to, uh -huh. to, to, to the uh, recreational area but after he came back he opened uh, a shoe shop in a little town called Webb, Mississippi, which is about 25 miles down the road because there were already two or three shoe shops in Clarksdale mm. and there was none in a little town of Webb, so he opened shop there and of course he transfer transferred back and forth to, mm -hmm. to Webb and of course the, the economic condition certainly was much better than mm -hmm. when we relied completely on the farm. Mm -hmm. What was life like? Could you just talk a little bit about what life on the plantation was like? Uh, maybe the kinds of you know work you did, where you lived, and the dealings with the plantation owners? Or Well, at that time, see, I was about seven, eight years old when we left the plantation, and personally, I had little if of any dealings with uh, the man who owned the plantation. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly my mom and papa did, but that was little of any uh, contact that the children had with them, whatever directions that would for the family uh, that was done at a level you know that did not include instructions to children mm -hmm. but uh, as soon when we left the farm 
and moved into Clarksdale and the opportunity of purchasing a home and, and uh, living another style, certainly I was uh, more appreciative of the way we lived once we moved into Clarksdale than when we lived in the rural. Mm -hmm. Were you able to go to school more than the, the school? Yeah, oh yes, yes. The, schools the, in, the school system in Clarksdale <clears throat> was identical in terms of terms of, of terms. Mm -hmm. Black kids and white kids went to school at the same time. Mm -hmm. As in as long. So that area of racial discrimination uh, was overcome mm -hmm. by that, yes. What about people that you remembered, I mean, kind of role models or people who made an impact you, on you as a young person when you are in school there? Say, I'm sure your father and your parents did, mm -hmm. but you think of teachers or ministers or other people? Yeah, I can say in terms of impacting on your life, there were uh, several persons within the school system and, and ministers in the church opportunities. See, at that time, in the black community, teachers and preachers were the automatic uh, leaders. Everybody in the community knew who the teachers were, who the professors of schools were, and, and who the ministers were. And even though you came from out of town, everybody knew uh, if you were looking for a particular person in in a principalship, mm -hmm. uh, in a pastorship, almost everybody knew who you were, mm -hmm. who you were looking mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. I can remember a, a lady very vividly in, who was a sixth grade teacher, a lady by the name of Miss Geneva Edwards, that uh, was thorough, determined, but uh, is one of the persons that I can remember from a di discipline point of view that I feel has had somewhat an impact on some of the ways I think and feel. Mm -hmm. But really, I guess, the instructor that I had most, that had most impact Mm -hmm. upon my involvement in the human rights and civil rights operation was a civics teacher in high school, a lady by the name of T.K. Shelby, who had gone to school at Fisk and at Dillard. And, of course, in these days, the total school system was completely segregated. And her her involvement with understanding the human relations aspect of life, having come out of Fisk and Dillard, which were two uh, highly prominent institutions, particularly in black education. And they dealt a lot, they dealt to a large extent with overcoming uh, the barriers of racism. And in 11th grade, uh, Michelle, they had those of us who were moving, being promoted from 11th to 12th grade to be involved in literary, in literature reading of such books as uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Soul of Black Folk, uh, Lillian Smith's Strange Fruit, mm -hmm. uh, Richard Wright's uh, Black Boy, and, and Richard Wright wrote another book, Native Son, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there were book reports, you know, about them now in at our time during these periods of time in my time in high school on Fridays there was an appearance at the the school assembly and you would be required to if you had uh, done a literary activity that the teacher thought something of you were given the, you were not only given the permission but the direction to recite it to total school body mm -hmm. and that's when we had our programs on Friday at the at the, uh, the uh, assembly hour mm -hmm. and presenting our relate reactions to the reading of the books that Miss Shelby had given us to read uh, really had its impression upon the principal of school as well and I know I can remember his telling Miss Shelby that you know, these young people are going to be a credit to their race. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that mm -hmm. was one of the idioms that uh, mm -hmm. was used a lot in that time. Mm -hmm. So she also 
talked our entire senior class, this must have been around 38, 39, into joining the youth department of the NAACP. Mm. So the whole quarter at that time. And she was a member then. Yeah, she was, yeah, she was a member of the NAACP. And, uh, it must have been quite, I mean, that took a little, some courage just on its own in the late 30s. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm sure her educational experience at Dillard and Fisk, uh, there were people who impressed her, mm -hmm. that caused her to be impressive to us. And after finishing high school, 40, going to the armed service in 43, uh, imbued with trying to correct all the problems you saw <laughs> and uh, doing it immediately, and finding in the armed service the same kinds of human relations difficult problems that were in vogue everywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, in the armed service when I went in in 43, Blacks and whites didn't live together. We didn't, we didn't play together. Uh, we didn't eat together in the dining room. We didn't go to church together. Mm -hmm. It was a completely segregated situation. I was inducted into the Army in Camp Shelby, Mississippi. Did the early part of that uh, training air, training activity at Fort McClellan in Alabama, mm -hmm. and then moving on to to. Uh, two or three camps, in, in uh, one in Texas and two or three in California. Mm -hmm. But where we, we were, even in California, uh, there was this racial discrimination uh, being practiced by, by the armed service. And we got into to trying to deal with, with that difficulty. And of course, at somewhere around 45, I'm sure there was a, in the Pittsburgh Courier, I don't know if you know what that is now. Yeah. Pittsburgh Courier was a black newspaper coming out of Pittsburgh. There were stories often from a man by the name of A. Philip Randolph, who was a labor leader, uh, but uh, who was very much concerned about racial discrimination still being in vogue in the armed service. Mm -hmm. And he tried to convince Herr Truman to move toward eliminating it and he finally threatened uh, the president with a call to all blacks in the armed service to lay down their weapons and no longer participate because of uh, this kind of identification showing that the United States did not appreciate its black soldiers nearly to the extent that it appreciated white soldiers. So. I was a part of, of uh, a part of the beginning movement of integration. There were 200 of us, of blacks and whites, that were stationed at a little place called Sand Island, which is off of the outside of Oahu, mm -hmm. in the Hawaiian group. Mm -hmm. And there we lived together. And to some extent, this was one of the successful experiences of working black and white soldiers mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think it was 1947 that uh, President issued the executive order that eliminated uh, segregation in the armed services. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, was glad to be a part of the Philip Randolph effort and to yeah. have, have participated in trying to get that Oscar mm -hmm. behind us. Mm -hmm. Voice. Did you talk among yourselves? I mean, I'm, I'm interested in the, the the young black soldiers. Did you mm -hmm. talk about issues like this? Oh yes, mm -hmm. indeed. That was, uh, and with the non-commissioned officers, we talked with the older black soldiers too. Mm -hmm. And none of us uh, were in support of the of the segregation. You see, not only did we not, you know assemble together and work together, but usually the areas where you lived uh, were noticeably uh, different from where white soldiers lived. Well, whatever was the worst part of the ground, mm -hmm. that's where the black soldiers were assigned. <clears throat> and it's you, you, you learn that soon, you learn that fast. Did you make connections then back to your home places and the 
kind of conditions that you've grown up in, the situations, say in Mississippi or Alabama? Oh, yeah, it, it, it was the same. Uh -huh. It was the same, you know, I'm saying it was just about the same thing way things were in Mississippi, right? Mm -hmm. And having a little bit of a, of a exposure to to things as they are and say things as they ought to be uh, from the human relations point of view. Uh, didn't call it civil rights in those days, but it was still, the, the idiom was the same. The necessity of trying to, to, to overcome these issues really based on a Christian doctrine that uh, you know, all people should have the same opportunity to do what was to be done, uh, and rooting your argument in in that language, and really, the older so soldiers really used much of the parable of of the Jews' exodus, uh, you know, from Egypt mm -hmm. to, to to the what uh, mystically was called the Promised Land, but the whole thing was. It's about overcoming uh, deprivation and moving to a better opportunity. Mm -hmm. And in the the uh, church school operation, there's quite a bit of church school or mm -hmm. good that goes on mm -hmm. in, in the armed service. But that was the way that the older soldiers, uh, that's what they use a lot in trying to encourage younger soldiers that there was a rightness in what you were trying to do and that it was wrong for uh, the discrepancies because of race to mm -hmm. to be so prevalent and, and you need to do what you can to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, this, this is backing up just a little mm -hmm. bit, Richard Wright and, and the, the re what was your response when he was a, a black Mississippian who moved and moved to Chicago and writing, but, but writing about Mississippi? It, well, I was more into uh, the story that he gave than about his personal life, the fact that he had left the South mm -hmm. and had uh, gone into to the North, Chicago, and then finally over to France, mm -hmm. to where he felt it was uh, more dignified to live. But the the bigger Thomas, I don't know if you remember yeah, that. Yeah, I've read yeah. Remember that story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, the trouble he had after he had uh, had had sex with the girl and and didn't want her to cry out and put the pillow over it and smothered her to death and mm -hmm. and uh, the the boy Jan that that it was his lawyer mm -hmm. that, that that you know tried to defend him that I still remember a whole lot about that. Mm -hmm. The uh, so the armed forces really was a. I mean that was interesting. So, that, and the, and you were really part of one of the first integrated units mm -hmm. in that. Well, I was you know, I was a part of one of the trial units. Trial. This uh -huh. was before. See, inter oh, yeah. this was in forty six. I think forty five. Forty six. Mm -hmm. We were on Oahu. Mm -hmm. And we were up there on Sand Island, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a you know a little part mm -hmm. of Oahu. But the order was not signed until forty seven. I was out of the armed service when the executive order was really signed. Mm -hmm. It's no wonder they. Whites in Mississippi were worried when black soldiers started coming home with those new ideas, not with new ideas. Well, but yes, ideas. but you know, I, I, I've heard stories of, <laughs> of when black soldiers came home out of the First World War. They were not able, allowed to wear a uniform. There were blacks who were bicked and keyed and kicked and lynched and all that, mm -hmm. you know, for continuing to wear a uniform because it, you know, just was assumed. Uh, if you particularly they went to France, and one thing the white male southerner still has a whole lot of difficulty dealing with, if it has some, if there is some knowledge that a black guy has had sexual relationships with a white girl, mm -hmm. boy, that tears them up. <laughs> <laughs> France was one of the place they thought that was possible. very much possible, uh -huh. and of course there were a lot of soldiers who. Who talked about it? I think more they talked more than they did. Sure. <laughs> you, um, so, what was your what was your what were your hopes and expectations when you came home from the army? What you're a young man? 
Well, yes, and when I came home from the army, I matriculated to Xavier University, uh, Jesuit mm-hmm. activity that uh, was, I, I guess, as important an experience that of anything that I've ha- ever had. Because at Xavier, uh, the the treatment of the student body. Uh, had li- little or nothing to do with ethnic background. There were not as many white students on campus as black, uh, because you had Loyola and several other Catholic institutions in New Orleans, but in the field of pharmacy, uh, where where my field was, uh, Xavier finally became the only institution in New Orleans that was offering pharmacy, and uh, uh, white kids who wanted pharmacy came to Xavier. Mm-hmm. And there developed a good rapport and relationship uh, among those of us who were, you know, involved in that academic. Now, one thing we had to deal with at Xavier was there was a phrase, a clause in the charter of the institution that really had to, to do with showing that the school was open to everybody. But the phrase is, was geared toward the institutions would always be open to Negroes and Indians. Well, you know, that, that was indicated into some of our understanding of a preferential, you know, kind of thing. And, and the white kids on the campus, they were not... Uh, really openly uh, bitter, I guess, about it. But they were, every now and then you get into a discussion and it come out. So we finally, you know, took a position that that uh, just as we do not like to see situations where white only and only on those kind of crazy things, that uh, this idiom in, in the charter of the institution was just as objective. Mm-hmm. Objectionable to members of another ethnic, and if, you know. So we went to uh, the to the uh, to the bishop of the diocese, and, and uh, there we first we worked with. You're know, backing up a little bit. Uh, during the year of 1947 or eight, I believe, we organized a collegiate activity called NSA, the National Students Association, mm-hmm. which was one of the, I guess, ultra-liberal things on, on, on college campuses. And as we proceeded to do that, the Catholic Church as an, as an entity uh, proceeded to organize a project called NFCCS, the National Federation of Catholic College Students. Mm. And in in that, there was uh, a relationship, really, you know, between the two. Uh, they were pretty well student groups that had a great desire for for change in terms of, of what the body, basic body politic of the country was. So in, in that, that's where I think the greatest emphasis for overcoming the, the charter uh, r- recitation to mm-hmm. blacks and Indians or Negroes and Indians being the school always being open mm-hmm. to them. And in organizing the National Students Association, I don't know if you ever remember the name. Uh, Albert Lewin, Al Lewinstein. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. uh, I helped Al Lewinstein get elected to, to oh. the uh-huh. presidency of, oh, of NSA. And huh. really went up to New York with him a couple of times to help him in, in his uh, races for mm-hmm. House, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the legislature. And we, the NAACP, as I say, you know, I joined the NAACP when I was 11th grade student. In 1941, uh, the NAACP filed uh, its motion to 
to deal with Brown versus Kansas. Mm -hmm. Of course, it was uh, 1954 before we finally got a decision out of that. But there were those of us who were what you call ambassadors for the decision to be a call to desegregate public education because uh, it, you know, it just wasn't the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, I still feel that that one of the the basic laggards in overcoming negative racism is an institution that I have a lot of admiration for in, in many ways, and that's the Christian Church. You know, I've been a part of that institution all my life when I was in America. It is not the public school, it's the Sunday school. Mm -hmm. At 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. God's church is more segregated than yeah. baseball, yeah. football, uh, the movies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and until you and me can kneel at the rail of God and break bread and drink wine and accept each other as our brother at that point, mm -hmm. then we are not able to completely be able to accept each other anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how did you uh, choose Xavier in, in, a, in a Catholic institution? Had you ever had contact with with uh, Catholics and no? Mm -hmm. I wanted pharmacy. You wanted pharmacy. How did, why were you interested in pharmacy? Well, I tell you, I, while I was in the armed service, mm -hmm. there were at least two or three instances where the the fellows who were involved in medical aids. Uh, at the time that I was in the armed service, the contacting of a venereal disease, gonorrhea or whatever, uh, meant an automatic demotion to the bottom of the ladder. And the fellows that I knew that were in the medical area uh, often would not respond to providing medication, didn't, didn't have nothing but really uh, sulfathiazole and sulfadiazine to sulfur pill because mm -hmm. penicillin was just beginning mm -hmm. to be uh, made available. But the staff sergeants and, and officers and all that were trying to, to uh, get medical assistance without having to go on sick call and all that and, and uh, have to be bounced down to the bottom of the ladder and, and there was so much, much uh, refusal, you know, I, and I just didn't like it. And I, I thought that uh, if I ever have the opportunity, I'm going to try to, mm -hmm. you know, help out, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. for, particularly not only, you know, in that case, but I thought that was an example of some of the things that, that disturbed me. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the basic reasons why I went into farms. So you had basically a positive experience at Xavier and in New Orleans. Oh yeah, you How know. How did you like New Orleans? Well, I'm crazy about it. You know, <laughs> I, I was elected uh, the president of the student body oh. at Xavier and what the fact. <laughs> you figure that out. Huh. So, you know, as I say. It didn't, didn't matter. Well, no, but it's never been done before that since. Uh -huh. uh, I was the only student. Uh -huh. but, Came back to student body, not a member of the church. Okay. Huh. And so you had, you were there from what? Forty-six to fifty. Uh huh. And, uh, and and I was telling you about this clause. Yeah. In in charter, and we approached the bishop about it. We approached the administration about it. And graduation night, in nineteen fifty, the, when they called my name. Uh, the bishop announced that uh, as a graduation gift, we will announce to you that we have removed the clause in, in the charter that you felt uh, was not mm. the right to be. And, and, uh, I was glad of that. That's a nice present. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. er, earlier you had, you had mentioned um, 
something to the effect that you know, until we can break bread together, you know, we're not going to. Uh, until we kneel as brothers, whites and blacks. Where does where? How did that idea develop um, in your life, or where, where, where? Well, I believe that until it can take place in the church, mm-hmm. that we are not. See, when you're in church on Sunday morning, me, I feel that I'm the best person that I'm going to be. And until I can do a thing when I'm at my best, then when I'm at a ball game or somewhere else, then it's not uh, going to really be a result of what really is me. There are going to be superficial reasons. There are going to be things that are unreal about it. And as I say, until, until it gets to be to the position that you can do it and accept completely other ethnic groups as a part of your human relations profile, then you got still got something to overcome. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, I, I think a lot of, of uh, the philosophy and ethics and dogma that uh, I, I have learned academically and, and uh, shall we say, in, in the world. It, I, I just feel that, that all of us ought to try our best to make sure that we respond to people because of what they do or what they don't do. Mm-hmm. That uh, the melanin presence or absence should not be a factor mm-hmm. in that area. And you thought this was fundamentally more important than, say, Equality and education. Yes, and that's that's because it's God's God's house. Right. Right. What when you came uh, when you got out of college? What, what did you? Well, have? when I got out of college, man, it was nineteen fifty, uh-huh. and I was if a major spokesman for what, for what the anticipated decision of Brown versus Kansas ought to be. I was uh, almost a daily speaker uh-huh. in some church, uh, some club, uh, uh-huh. preaching that integration ought to take place. Uh-huh. Well, this is coming out of your experiences in the student. Well, the student the well, really, place. really, I think my my great admiration for Thurgood Marshall and and uh, that group of folk who had filed mm-hmm. the, the motion for Brown versus Kansas. Mm-hmm. And the Supreme Court was taking so long to do anything about it. Well, and of course we sort of knew somewhere around the mid 40s, 46, 47, 48, that, 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 that an opinion was approaching and was probably imminent. And in so doing, as I say, I took uh, the position every chance I could, telling the, w- the community, get ready because we're coming. Mm-hmm. You know, good thing. Mm-hmm. Ain't gonna be no more black and white. It's gonna be us. So when I graduated from college, I, I'd, I'd gone to school on the GI Bill of Rights. If it hadn't been for GI Bill, I'm sure I never would have got there. Mm-hmm. But uh, the the getting into to the GI Bill and working with that, we I don't know whether you can do it now or not, but we had certainly a few dollars left uh, after this check came when you paid your tuition and all that. Mm-hmm. So I, I had close to eight hundred thousand dollars when I of of the, of the years that I was in school. Mm-hmm. And coming out I was I would try to to uh, go to the to the money institutions, borrow money to open drugstore. Well, see in Mississippi we have a law, still is, that if you plan to open your own store, you got to pass the Mississippi State Board. You may reciprocate from another state, but you will have to work under a registered pharmacist for a year. Mm-hmm. For you can't reciprocate, and that's still the law. Mm-hmm. Well, 
I didn't plan to work under anybody. I was going to try to open my own store. So I went over to, when time came to take the exam, I went over to the University of Mississippi. Uh, took the exam. That was not a, a restaurant, that was not a place on the campus where you could buy anything to eat. There was no place where you could sleep. Just so happened that the boy who's mayor now, John Leslie, mm -hmm. of the city of Oxford. He gave me his room on campus uh, and brought food and provided us with uh, books to study and old mm. tests. And, mm. and this is back in 1950. Mm. Did you have you know him? Well, there was a salesman from Ellis Bagwell Drug Company out of Memphis that knew John and his father. Mm -hmm. And John Betty was his name. John Daddy alerted John Leslie that I was going to be coming over and taking the exam. Well, John Daddy was the salesman for Walker's Drug Store, which was in Clarksdale, that I had done some apprenticeship mm -hmm. and really had been uh, the delivery boy a long, long time ago when I was 7th, 8th, ninth grade, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got on campus, John knew what the situation was going to be, mm -hmm. so he sought me out. Mm -hmm. And I was only like, do the class anyhow. So he had to look for. He had, <laughs> it was he had, easy to find. He had to look for. So that was mm -hmm. that was that experience. Yes. Oh. Uh, okay. So, uh, so you, uh, so you're at Mississippi, Ole Miss, and you're studying. Well, yeah, okay. as far as pharmacy. Mm -hmm. We took the state board of pharmacy over there, mm -hmm. came home, and after having taken the board, scored fairly well on the on the exam as far as all the students were concerned. And went to the first couple of banks to talk about borrowing money at open drugstore. And the first two or three people you talked to were fairly supportive. And then when it came down to... to uh, Really doing business, you know. Then you escalated up the ladder to, uh, I guess, to the people who really make the major decisions, and and it came. Said, well, look, you know, we like to help our hometown boys, but you talking about that mixing, you know, you, know, you can't uh, get all. If you change your service going that mixing business, then we might be able to help you. But otherwise. Uh, we help you and you around you talking about mixing, we're going to lose a lot of folks who support us. So, and we talked about it as well. No, I, I think I'm on the right track. I think it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I guess the, what I, I guess the, the uh, moral, I guess, of the story is I couldn't borrow a dime from nobody, you know, in, in, the, in the lending institutions. But maybe it it was problematical because uh, I took the little money I had and bought two or three things and then bought four or five and you know, until mm -hmm. we finally got the stock to where we needed it to be and without owing nobody nothing. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, of that same uh, position today. I don't owe nobody <laughs> a dime on nothing, you know. But if I had been able to start business, with the borrowing and paying back philosophy that most people who go into business do, I'd probably be in that mm -hmm. still there situation still. right now. Right? Yeah. Well, that gave you a tremendous amount of independence, not owing yeah. money to people. And, and, it, and I guess it, uh, it's had, it has its effect upon the things you decide you want to do or don't do. You know, you do it because you think it's the right thing to do, not because anybody can intimidate you. Mm -hmm. You know, can't nobody pull my loan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what was uh, so do, as you're starting your pharmacy, you're still very active in in NAACP. You're oh. still speaking and oh, yes. really agitating over mm -hmm. these, the, particularly around Brown, I guess at that time still. Well, yeah, I, we this was. Well, 1954, I'd organized the local branch of NACP in Clarksdale in 1953, mm -hmm. the year really before mm -hmm. the Brown decision. 
came down and and uh, I've, you know I worked uh, d diligently and deliberately within that structure a long time. I've been president of the Mississippi State Conference in ACP since 1960. Uh, still am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I've seen you know a lot of good times and some bad times. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't wouldn't have missed it, but it was. No. What was uh, what was your feeling when when the Supreme Court finally ruled in Brown? Oh man, I was twenty feet high. Mm -hmm. it, it was the right thing, I thought. Uh, certainly, I think that that there could have been uh, more of a determination to make the decision work. If you remember, Mr. Eisenhower uh, was president at the time that the decision came down and he has never said one word about it yet. Mm -hmm. He's not approved it or he hadn't disapproved it. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course the position of the president of the United States, whether you like him or not, uh, he, his impressions certainly have weight you know, throughout the country, and I think that we could have done, we could have had a much smoother transition as far as uh, the, the desegregation effort uh, was if we had had a president in the White House that openly supported it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Was there, uh, did you have hopes of, of that happening? Uh, in sometime soon, you know, after '54. Well, yes. What? Well, what we did here in Mississippi was that we uh, certainly encouraged the members of NAACP branches to to move toward implementation of the decision in their own communities, and it was really uh, a long time after the decision was rendered that we ever got the courts to move and direct the, the school system of Mississippi, really it was 1970, mm -hmm. before the school system of Mississippi took any kind of an action toward uh, supporting or implementing the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. What was the white reaction? Or did, did that have a, an impact on, on the way you felt and the kinds of work that you did in that? period after that, after 54? Well, yeah, there, there was quite a bit of uh, hostility. The, the decision of 54 certainly gave rise to the White Citizen Council, gave rise to the State Sovereignty Commission. Many people who put their names on petitions asking for school boards to implement the 1954 Supreme Court decision uh, were economically boycotted or harassed. Mm -hmm. uh, there were instances where people whose names were on the list, although they had money in their pocket, there were stores who wouldn't sell them food. You know, there was you know, this amount of mm -hmm. hatred and hostility, mm -hmm. you know, over that issue. So, oh you know, yes, it was bitterly resisted. Mm -hmm. And still is. We have not uh, gotten the, the support of the establishment of the state really yet in uh, dealing with the issue of integration. Yeah, yeah. And this whole fight over the colleges and funding for the university. And do you realize though that this is the first time in the history of the nation that the United States Supreme Court has taken a position on desegregation in higher education? Mm -hmm. well, I didn't know that. Yes. Huh. There have been district courts and individual judges that have taken positions. And of course there have been some states that have moved voluntarily mm -hmm. to try to move toward the integration issue. But this is the first time the United States Supreme Court has ruled regarding it. And of course we also know that ruling on the, that issue, dealing with the, the black premise is is certainly going to be a ricochet, if not a, a total bombshell, 
uh, with regard to students who attend black public colleges everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's right. What was your uh, feeling here in Mississippi as you start to see the, uh, well, say the Montgomery bus, bus boycott and the, the beginnings of a real... Oh, man, uh, I was 10 feet high. I was <laughs> glad. I was glad. And, of course, one thing you might not remember about the Montgomery bus boycott, that was, uh, this was three years after uh, the NAACP had been outlawed in Alabama. You see, the NAACP still has a position that it will not provide its membership roles to anybody, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if there's not a complete understanding bias as to why you want the roads. Well, I'm just, can you hold on just a second? Why don't you, well, I don't take it off the hook. Where were we here? Um, the boy got some. Oh yeah, the, the effects of the boy got Okay. The Montgomery boys boy got Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say that the at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott, the NAACP had been outlawed in the state of Alabama. It had been outlawed over the issue that the court had directed the field director for the NAACP to turn over the membership list of the NAACP to the uh, state government mm -hmm. of Alabama. This was under George Wallace. And of course, the, uh, we refused to do that. And so, therefore, the procedure to to uh, outlaw the organization, and we were ordered to cease and desist. At that time, the head of the NACP in Montgomery was a boy by the name of Ed Nixon. Mm -hmm. Going back to Ephraim Randolph, was a member of the uh, organization of the Sleeping Car Porters. And Ed had within the op his movement as a union member that there were activities he could participate in that upset the state of Alabama, but it didn't get him fired, you know, mm -hmm. because the all he had, he, what he had to do was obey the rules of the union and not, you know, violate that uh, activity. So Ed called several of us who were state conference presidents and branch presidents from nearby mm -hmm. into uh, Montgomery to try to see what we all could find a, find helpful in dealing with the Montgomery situation. Mm -hmm. And the night we came into to uh, I'm trying to think of the name of Ralph's church now. But anyway, it was the church that Ralph Abernathy mm -hmm. was the pastor of. And the issue of a leader for the movement was raised. The unanimous beginning request was for Ralph Abernathy to be the leader of the Montgomery bus movement. Mm -hmm. But Ralph had met Mark earlier and he took a position that uh, he had met a young man in town that just had come back from Crozier Theological Seminary and that uh, if we would give Martin chance, he would stand behind him all the way. Mm -hmm. So at that point, there was a support for Martin King to become head of the Montgomery Bus Boycott Movement. Mm -hmm. Now, my appreciation for that experience is how many people who could do good things, who never get the opportunity uh, to, to move forward uh, because there isn't a Ralph Abernathy every day willing to step back and give you know, somebody else a chance. Mm -hmm. So, but once we, they decided to, to go with Martin, uh, we, we were in and out of Montgomery on several occasions mm -hmm. because that was the biggest story mm -hmm. in, in the mm -hmm. civil rights op operation mm -hmm. at that time. And I remember one night, uh, just before going to court, what we had done, we, we had 
we had financed with with uh, public calls funding for a project uh, uh, called Carpu, mm -hmm. and with the Carpu, we were able to get people to work in back, and they didn't have to ride the bus. So you understood there were people who had jobs they had to get mm -hmm. to, uh, people who had mortgages on their home, children in school, had to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many reasons why people had to have transportation going, going and coming where they needed to go. Mm -hmm. And the bus was the most economical, didn't call it but dying, the bus was the most economical way of getting there at that point. Well, when we organized carpool, really what made the bus boycott work, if you rode the bus, you had to pay a dime. But if you rode the carpool, you didn't have to pay nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was one of the successes mm -hmm. of the carpool. Mm -hmm. And in, in fact, in, with the carpool taking everybody to work and back and all that, the, the uh, city council of Montgomery took the carpool issue to court on the basis that it was putting legitimate bus drivers out of work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Martin called a meeting one night into uh, to the church that he, he was now the pastor of Dexter. Avenue Baptist Church there, right near the Capitol in, in uh, Montgomery. And he was re really troubled and worried because from all we could understand that the, the issue of, of uh, having, having an embargo placed upon the carpool was really imminent, that that it could be done. Mm -hmm. And this had the, the uh, well, it, it provided for the demise of Martin's leadership if people had to go back to the bus, mm -hmm. you know, because the carpool would be eradicated. Uh, it, it, it would have been a defeat for the, the whole opportunity of trying to overcome discrimination and segregation. There were many areas that that we just felt that it would be too so devastating. So I remember when Martin called us into Dexter, he took his text from the book of Jeremiah and he dealt with the subject, uh, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician here? But after he preached all about that, he finally came back to the fact that that the black slaves in America uh, had straightened out the question mark of is there no bomb in Gilead too? There is, in a black song, a bomb in Gilead that makes the wounded humble. There is a bomb in Gilead that heals the sin sick soul. And that whole negative expression and closing with that kind of a positive gave us all a little bit of uplift, you know. Mm -hmm. So the next morning we went to court and, and uh, Mar all of us getting close to Martin as we could. Little, mm -hmm. little, little Martin Rebalk, you know. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He was really our greatest thing we ever had. Mm -hmm. So every question, every time our lawyers raised an objection, the judge uh, took a position over overruled. Every time they, every time they raised a question about something we were doing, the judge was sustained. Mm -hmm. Oh man, he was beating us up. <laughs> so somewhere around eleven o'clock that morning, a uh, messenger came to the door, and the bailiff met him, and he gave the bailiff uh, an envelope to carry to the judge, and the judge declared a twenty-minute recess and. And so as we sat around, Martin sort of sensed, I don't know how he could, he could have, that something big was about to happen. And he told us, that, you know, something going on, I don't know what it is, but we just have to wait and find out. But I guess the look on the judge's face and the fact that without being asked, he called a recess in the whole court, you know, mm -hmm. some things were not, not usual, I mm -hmm. guess. 
So the, you, the cat from UPI that brought the message came on over to, to where we were sitting and he told Dr. Mark King, he said, there's a message off ticket tape that uh, you might uh, be interested in. So Martin said, okay, what is it? So we gave him the thing off his table and it said that today at 10 o'clock in Washington, D.C., the United States Supreme Court declared segregation in Montgomery, Alabama unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. So he said, it didn't matter now, you know, what the judge said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, there were hoops and hollers and no order in court and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, that's, that, that was how that, you know, mm -hmm. really ended up because there was enough, I guess, belief and courage and, and wanting to overcome mm -hmm. that people just stuck with it although there were times in the process that failure seemed them. Um, uh, I mean, just one thing after another in the 60s, and we don't need to go through kind of mm -hmm. you know, daily detail. That would take hours and hours just mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. think about that. And, and so we'll, maybe we'll kind of move to the... Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering uh, kind of how you're, how you're thinking about the relationship between... The, the political problems, the, the issues of segregation, of voting, of education, uh, and the economic problems, the, the very obvious economic problems that are partly a result of that, partly a lot of other things that, that are facing blacks in the South at that point. Uh, how, does, how do you start in the 60s, you know, as Martin King does, moving the, the getting the movement moved in that direction, starting to, to raise these larger uh, questions about things. Do you, do you have some sense of how that began to unfold in the... Well, I, I, you know, from, from my own, you know, development and, and, and understanding, it just came about at the time that we were able to, in our own minds, uh, see the necessity of if we are going to to move out of the difficult position that we find ourselves in uh, because of the ethnic thing that we have got to be willing to assume the sacrifices and, and have the difficulties that face us uh, put in a proper perspective so that although there are these times that you'd rather not have, but you have to also realize that if you're ever going to get to where you're trying to go, you're going to have to, you know, to deal with it. Not, well, you can't have an omelet unless you're going to break the eggs. Mm -hmm. You just got to, to, to have a determination to, to deal with it regardless of what are the circumstances and consequences. Mm -hmm. You know, each of us, I'm sure, have had to to find out in our own, not in our own minds, but to, to see if we've got the the uh, the ability, the, the tenacity, to stay with it, although it gets difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, all the those of us who I know who have tried to, to deal with this thing have just, you know, taken a position that uh, can't get be no worse. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, the whole mm -hmm. thing to do is get better. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, Mississippi produced some, some really extraordinary individuals, leaders that, that you, many of whom you helped nurture and bring along as who are a little bit younger, who are, you know, didn't go through the war like you did, who really came of age in that period right after the war, uh, you know, that you worked with in mm -hmm. some cases. Mm -hmm. The NAACP was certainly an important movement there. How, how did you interact with these, I mean, the, the, the uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about your relationship to say people who are working with SNCC, who, who both are from Mississippi and from other places, how did that generational thing um, how did you feel about it as you started seeing all the? I mean, I'm sure you felt very positive about it, but how, how did that... Well, you see, this our major uh, movement with the total 
number of people involved in Mississippi was 1963, 1964. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we had uh, some presence of CORE, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee at Southern Christian Leadership Conference in the ACP. And I would say the, the basic glue that, that we all surrendered to uh, was the right to, to register and vote. That many of us felt that if we could get the right to register and vote, we could at least eliminate some of the problems that we faced. Well, in Mississippi in 1963, we organized a body known as COFO. That was the Council of Federated Organizations, which uh, was the Mississippi presence of CORE, SNCC, SELC, and NACP. Mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, elected chairman mm -hmm. by that group, by the, the four, Nell Ponder was SELC, uh, Bob uh, Moses mm -hmm. was SNCC. Uh, uh, I was in the ACP and, and uh, CORE was represented by David Dennis, who's now down in uh, Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. Well, f fortunately, the four of us were, I guess, uh, uh, appreciative of each other mm -hmm. and worked uh, together harmoniously. I don't know of any other state, because I really haven't looked to see much, but I don't know of any. And I've heard often that there has been no other state where the four units worked as effectively mm -hmm. together as we did here in the in the state of of, uh, of Mississippi. Well, two or three things happened to us, uh, happened with us. You know, several of us had gone with the Freedom Rider movement, you know, and had spent 30 days in the state penitentiary and. Mm -hmm. The fellas naked, no clothes, mm -hmm. and it was an integrated, you know, situation. There was no jail in the state that uh, wanted us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we, we didn't want them. <laughs> right. But uh, the, the maximum security cell at Parchman was empty, mm -hmm. and that's where that's where they put you. Well, we were incarcerated, right? Mm -hmm. And we were incarcerated because we wouldn't put up bond. You see, Mississippi had a terrible record then. You put a bond, but it was gone. Mm -hmm. you, didn't, you didn't get it back. <laughs> so that was, you know, over 100 of us, and $300 here and $400. But, and then, you know, that, that welded us together, you know, mm -hmm. to some extent. Mm -hmm. And in the, in the voter, edu voter registration, you know, situation we had. It was uh, in 1964 on the boardwalk in Atlantic City where we challenged the national political structure mm -hmm. to uh, open its doors to minorities, women, and youth. Mm -hmm. And of course, we got a partial victory in uh, 1964 in terms of the Democratic Party agreeing that it would correct that, def that uh, deficit within its structure. Mm -hmm. And in 1968, if you recall, we went back right. and were uh, voted in as the unit in Mississippi that represented mm -hmm. the, the National Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. The prior to going into the Democratic uh, committee venture. I was asked. Well, we all looked at trying to to deal with giving the people a cause, a real reason for wanting to vote. Mm -hmm. now, we realized that unless you got something on the ballot or somebody that they want to vote for, a lot of folks don't go vote. Mm -hmm. You know. So I don't know if you remember the fellow Ed King. Mm -hmm. Ed King was a white uh, minister, minister yeah. instructor at Tupelo. Ed and I ran for the I ran for governor 
He had ran for lieutenant governor. And uh, we attracted more than 70,000 uh, participants. Now, we were trying to do two or three things there. We were asking Bobby Kennedy and, and uh, Hubert Humphrey and, and uh, with the boy from, from uh, Indiana, uh, Butch Bai, uh, George Mitchell, m many of our friends in Congress, we were asking them to support, you know, support us in passage of the Voter Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Eastland, Mr. Stennis, and, and the members of the House were saying, don't bother about that. If they get the right to vote, they ain't going to use it. Mm -hmm. So in order to try to overcome uh, that counter position, we decided we would run a freedom vote campaign. Mm -hmm. And we put ballot boxes everywhere we could, churches, folks, poets, business, all mm -hmm. that. So we, as I say, we attracted more than 70,000 uh, people in that opportunity. And that was one of the many little things, I guess, that came together mm -hmm. to help pass the Voter Rights Act of mm -hmm. 1965. But one thing that grew out of that is really uh, still having its emphasis today. Uh, I was, I went to, to uh, WLBT, television station, mm -hmm. to buy time for my campaign, mm -hmm. which was to run for governor. So, the fellow name was Mr. Beard, I've forgotten what his first name was. What are you doing? I said, nigga, you crazy. Get your ass out of here. So, you know, say you know damn time on this TV station talking about governor. You get out of here. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I just thought I'd come out and ask. But you see, the issue was, it was not a campaign that I was running only because I wanted to run. The race for governor was the black, it was the Mississippi campaign, supported generally by blacks, but some whites as well. Mm -hmm. And when I reported to them that night, what uh, the, my experience in trying to buy the time, mm -hmm. the National Council of Churches had a team in the state that uh, was here to help us overcome the issues of racism. And when I to told them what had happened, well, the chairman of communications of the United Church of Christ, who was here, came over to me and said, look, son, he said, I know you don't like being called a nigger. He said, but I tell you what, if we go back down there tomorrow and they give us the same answer, mm -hmm. and the United Church of Christ will combine with the NACP and we'll sue the hell out of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that is a violation of FCC and they cannot operate a television station and conduct themselves in that manner. We will have their license revoked. I said, well, you know, we can call nigga one more time and go ahead and then let's go. So when we, as soon as we got in the door, Beard looked up and said, look, nigga, I told you yesterday that we wasn't going to say you no damn time on this TV station. And yeah, you're back here today. Get your ass out of here. That's because you got that white Yankee with you this morning. I ain't going to help you now. I said, okay, so we tried. So that really... You know, gave uh, Parker, every Parker was his name. It really gave Parker the, the go ahead and really what uh, we ought to do. Mm -hmm. So we filed suit uh, against the station in 1965. It took f four years, 1969, to the United States Supreme Court and, and FCC mm -hmm. finally ruled that Lamar Life, that was the only station there, had to divest his license. Mm -hmm. And they proceeded to to be sure that the group that that became the possessors of the right to operate the station was 51% minority. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, you know. That's what this for. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. right. So the nigga that couldn't buy time. <laughs> In nine, <laughs> nine chairman <laughs> voted right. <laughs> right. What, uh, you know, you, you're talking about the Congress and the senators and the and all these politicians and they're, you know, you're constantly kind of working with them trying to get the passage of these things. Other 
the other thing that's going on then is is this war on poverty. I mean, that, that, that Johnson has declared. How yeah. Did that, how, did, how did you feel? Well, about that? you see, well, let me go back to this a little bit. When Medgar was killed in 63, well, prior to that time, using, I was using really our experience in, uh, in, in Harry Truman's uh, position on preventing segregation in the armed service. I tried, and so did uh, Medgo and several more of us, to get John Kennedy to take a position that the federal government would not support armed service organizations that practice segregation. Mm -hmm. Just prior to that, because of our NAACP interaction, the four of us had been kicked out of the American Legion. You know, the NAACP was considered a communist front organization by a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. Not just here, but mm -hmm. there and yonder. Mm -hmm. So when they uh, divested us from membership in the American Legion, that's when we appealed to the president to, you know, come to our rescue. Mm -hmm. Well, John Kennedy was empathetic to what we were talking about. But before he got around to doing it, Mecca was killed. And I would say white guilt, uh, uh, his own uh, concern about what he did or didn't do. He called down one morning and invited me to bury Medgar in Arlington, if I would accept his offer. Mm. And so we discussed that for a while, and that was real good, you know. Mm. Mississippi boy, been buried in Arlington, but of course, I'm not too sure right now it was the best thing, but because all of the, us who have a desire to visit with Medgar got to go up there. Yeah. And if it was down here, it would be, you know, a different situation. But Anyway, we, we agreed and it was preaching it. Well, the president invited Murley, who was uh, Megha's wife, right. and me and Charles and Megha's children to be their guests at Blair House, which was across from the White House, while arrangements was made to bury Megha. Well, that took about a week, you know, before we got it and finally the day of the burial. Well, in the, in the meantime, uh, Bobby was assigned uh, to work with Charles. You know, anything Charles wanted, you know, he had somebody to touch base with. And I'm Teddy. Teddy, Teddy was, mm -hmm. Teddy and I were assigned. Mm -hmm. and we still, <laughs> our relationships are still the best. Mm -hmm. uh, Nan and Ethel, I mean, Merle and Ethel were prepared. So that, you know, uh, gave us a relationship with, with, with the president that, and, and his family that uh, you just cherish, I guess, the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And when Sarge called down, Sarge, as you know, is, is a brother-in-law or something. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah. And he wanted to push for the the uh, uh, I'm trying to think of exactly what they call the thing Office of Economic Opportunity mm -hmm. Bill mm -hmm. and he wanted me and and of course the other girl is uh, to come up and you're talking about Fannie Hamer mm -hmm. to come up and testify relative to the need for it, we went, and because of that, uh, you know, relationship and identity, our involvement in trying to make sure that the program was a success, we preached it everywhere mm -hmm. and caused as many people as we know to get involved in it. Mm -hmm. And we had some good days and some bad days. We had a program, CDGM, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Mississippi that. Uh, had more baggage and difficulties uh, than I'm going to talk to you. we had more baggage and difficulties that that we could really uh, continue with in that the exam the 
the audit of CDGM by both uh, Stennis and Eastland, certainly two anti-program, anti-poverty program personalities, but still when you let people who certainly are so opposed to what you're doing gather that much information about you, it is very hard to to continue to justify uh, what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. So what we finally worked out, well, really, I went, I went to the executive director of CDG and told him what the, the uh, examinations as I was, had been informed showed. Mm-hmm. So Mudd, who was the man, told me, he said, well, look, just because the federal government put that money down here, they can't tell me how to spend it. <laughs> they go, who tell you? how to spend it, but, you know, he, somehow, that that was a, a, a problem that we just never could overcome, and Sarge, who had funded CDGM, I know, partially because of my involvement with him, mm-hmm. uh, prevailed upon me to help put together an organization to make sure that the poverty program was not removed from Mississippi, but to help put together a board of directors that would abide by the rules and regulations as were interpreted and as we understood them. Mm-hmm. So we got Owen Cooper and Charles Young and, and uh, uh, Reverend, Mo, Reverend Merrill Lindsay, uh, Reverend R.L.T. Smith, about eight, nine of us I believe. We put together an organization known as Mississippi Action for Progress Map. Mm-hmm. And of course, the counties that CDGM was serving are still being served. Uh, Map serves about half of the state, and, and uh, Friends of Children serves about half the state. So the whole program was saved, mm-hmm. but it had to be done by securing a board of directors that Sergeant Shrivers felt comfortable with. Mm-hmm. Now, you see, the authorities of Mississippi were very anti-CDGM, mm-hmm. their whole program. Mm-hmm. And in order to get the president, get, get uh, Sergeant Shriver to override the veto of the governor of the state of Mississippi, uh, we just had to give him some reason mm-hmm. to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. So. That, that was one of the real, real crises yeah. in our state, but we were finally able to overcome it. What was, the, what was so uh, threatening to the, to the power structure in the state from CDGM in addition to Well, the what, what was so threatening, this was the first time a federal program had come into the state where the white community was not automatically in charge of the money. Mm. You see, the, the Head Start program, uh, rule of thumb, was that you had to involve, in proportion to their existence in the community, uh, the, peop- the ethnicity of the people who live in the area. Mm-hmm. Whites couldn't get it by themselves, blacks couldn't get it by themselves, unless either side could prove that the other group simply would not participate. So the reason for much of the white participation at first came in because they didn't want the blacks to have access to the money and they had nothing to do with it. Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, uh, I'm trying to think the young boy who is now in Atlanta. But it, no, he was, he, one time he was the regional director for, for the Hit Start program in Mississippi. He's, he's, uh, but anyway, he, he, he used a story one night to say that, that once the blacks and the whites start sitting around, see, Mississippi has a, has a Head Start program in every county in the state, which also means that now at least once a month in every county in the state there's a biracial group sitting down talking about the community. And they don't only talk about Head Start. Mm-hmm. They talk about who's going to be president, 
who's going to be governor, who's going to be mayor, mm-hmm. who's going with who, who had a baby, mm-hmm. who, you know, who, whatever. And Sonny Walker, mm-hmm. Sonny Walker. Mm-hmm. And he said that finally the white folks and the black folks in Mississippi decided if, if we had known y'all was like you is, we'd have been liking y'all a long time ago. <laughs> and that pretty well is, 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 is a lot of truth to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because the more you begin to associate and the more you begin to, to see people act in their own uh, ability and own way of acting, you do get to, to see mm-hmm. that you put on your pants one leg at a time. Mm-hmm. You ain't got no, mm-hmm. no real lot of differences between. Mm-hmm. Did, uh, did the controversy and the, the crisis with the CDGM thing and the move to MAP, did, how did that if, I mean, you were kind of the center of that. Mm-hmm. Did that create problems and tensions with you with the well, it, it, Yeah, yeah, it created some. Mm-hmm. But uh, longevity will deal with it. <laughs> longevity will deal yeah, with it. Yeah. And right now, there's absolutely none. Yeah. The, uh, but, you know, the fact that the whole program was saved is the thing that yeah. gives me a, a feeling of appreciation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And you moved very quickly... I guess it was right after that. Is it was a, you were a major force in, in getting the organization to Home County, the community action program there. Yeah, right. yeah. We were. I think we were probably the second in the state. Yeah. Yes. Was CDGM the first really mm-hmm. kind of mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of the mm-hmm. first? Mm-hmm. Uh, how did the thing in Tacoma County? How did how did that evolve? And we've got we had some some material that we read. Well, the. It was just as difficult as CDGM as far as the white leadership, you know, was concerned in terms of, of not participating. But we cert- we did have uh, four or five members of the white community who were practical enough, religious enough, and understood economics enough to to uh, say that that uh, we'll go with you and we'll take the heat. I'm talking about Andy Carr, Oscar Carr. Uh, 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 boy who's uh, Harvey Ross uh, about 10 of the members of the white community stood by the organization of Home Opportunities mm-hmm. Incorporated mm-hmm. and you know, we couldn't get either senator or no member of the house mm-hmm. to endorse us mm-hmm. but uh, we went up and carried our own water mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, like I say, our relationship with with the director of the program, Sergeant Triver, mm-hmm. really had its uh, had its effect. Mm-hmm. I noticed in there, and we were reading that what it was like. I'll tell you about. It, it created three three hundred and fifty jobs in the county. You know? I'm sure that's true. And one of the things I've been, and <clears throat> other people have told us this too, but that that in some ways these these anti war anti poverty programs were. Some of the biggest employers, sure. and they—I mean—and the, they posed a threat. Just well, right now, I would say the anti-poverty program, perhaps to uh, you know, under state government, state government is probably the largest. Mm-hmm. But I would say anti-poverty program is probably the second or third mm-hmm. in the state. In the state, yes. Wow. So that really had a, it. It really transformed these communities in some ways, in ways that the civil rights movement didn't have because it, it yeah, money. Well, here, here, and, yeah, right. Here, the anti-poverty program had the financial <coughs> had had the financial stability to not only say to people, "This is what we ought to do," but this is what we ought to do, and we can exist by doing it. Yeah. With the CDGM project, I know we were up in the archives in Washington last week and reading through some of the OEO documents and some of the field reports, and I think this, this program as well as others uh, in the north as well, I think there was, there was some criticism that they were hiring people that perhaps were, uh, the qualifications came into uh, uh, scrutiny, but, but also there was some criticism that essentially that it wasn't a program really for kids, it was a program to hire poor people. <coughs> And I'm just I'm curious between the two programs, the, the CDGM and the Cahoma County, did, were there fundamental differences of, 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 of who you hired to participate uh, 
in the various uh, uh, I, I don't I don't I don't think that I think my problem with CDGM uh, really had to to do with the 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 budget issue you wrote a budget spend this for that and this so much for that but none of that mattered you know uh, as the programs kept going the and I also, don't put this down, Okay. I also talked to a boy by the name of Levin, who's a, who's a psychiatrist, who really helped put CDGM together. And he told me that, uh, that uh, he really uh, had to uh, put aside uh, so much money unaccounted for because of the thievery that took place, mm -hmm. you know, with anything. Well, I, I can, you know, not be too upset by that because when people are hungry, people don't have uh, the tools to deal with economics. You, you get uh, your money things all mixed up. Frankly, I can't keep up with it either. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> when, you, when a program is set up with an anticipation of, you know, that that encourages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's more the more the budgetary yeah. aspect of it. Mm -hmm. of the... <clears throat> yeah. How would you? Uh, how would you assess in the the impact that the the these war and poverty, these social programs of OEO and Head Start, all these different things. Have, what, what kind of impact did they have on the lives of, say, the, the average rural citizen in Mississippi? I'm going to tell you, Head Start and the, and the Community Action Agency programs, mm -hmm. uh, and like backing up, I've been <clears throat> subjectively allied with the NACP as long as I can remember you know, in terms of participating. But the the support of the board of directors of the community action agencies and Head Start programs have been certainly as effective in helping to put aside some of the negative racism that has disappeared as far as Mississippi is concerned. Uh, as as much as in ACP sometimes or more. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> hmm. That's this has gotten people, people had to work together. Yep, uh -huh. in order to get programs in that community. Mm -hmm. There had to be mm -hmm. uh, a relationship. There had to be an umbrella mm -hmm. under which to stand in order for things to take place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the people themselves who are the beneficiaries of these, do you think they've, they've made these have been important things for them too? Yes, you, you have. You see, I have seen the program go from when it wasn't existent to where it is now. Mm -hmm. And in, in the areas where, where bathroom facilities had to be installed, where there were none in a whole community before. And I've seen little children go into the bathroom wanting to drink water out of the caboot because it was the cleanest water they, they'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. So, you know, certainly that's a, that's a, a dramatic example, but still it gives you some indication as to, as to how much improvement in terms of people's thinking and people's action mm -hmm. that the program has had. Mm -hmm. So just the establishment of these kind of biracial associations and boards the discussions that happen. Oh yeah, that's that in itself has had a positive impact on very research. much. It has caused people to. You see, you can read about what another ethnic is, but when you've sat with him, when you had, had to eat with him, when you listen to his discussion as well as your discussion on how the program ought to go, mm. and then you develop more of of a desire to be with. You end up uh, sharing a, a fifth of four roses. Uh, you share. Uh, you really 
begin to look at a girl that both of you would like to be with. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these kinds of things uh, melt the differences that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you both one day thought could never be overcome. Mm -hmm. So part of an assessment in this area ought to include that, not simply economically what it's... Yeah, yeah. yeah. It ought to include the human relations yeah. bringing together, yes. Yeah, that's something that's we hadn't really hadn't thought, thought about that that much, but that's, that's interesting. How did you, I mean, I know the, in this in the community, in the coma, what was it called? Coma Kind? Yeah. The, Organization, whatever the CAP program that Home did. Opportunities Corps. Opportunities Corps, mm -hmm. right. Uh, <clears throat> you played I mean, it, it, an important role in that in helping bring these different people together, both in terms of getting moderate whites and also getting other members of the black community who were probably hesitant to sit down and actually work in some of these groups themselves. How, how where did you get that, uh, or, or how, how do you express that kind of, that vision that you had, or, or your, the strategies that you employed to do that? What, what, what were you trying to accomplish? Well, I was, you know, really trying to accomplish the, the, the necessity of people understanding that in order for the programs to go forward, everybody had to participate. Now there were <clears throat> members of the Board of Supervisors uh, in my county that I lived in that, that uh, refused to be a part of the board as long as I was there. You know, so uh, I left it up to the other persons who had agreed to serve. What do we do? And uh, they told the Board of Supervisors guys goodbye. You know, we can make it without you. So that, that, you know, you usually find when there is a confrontation over the issue of race, that whites will stick with whites and blacks will stick with blacks. But uh, more and more now, uh, we're finding that what the issue is determines where people's loyalties are. Mm -hmm. That's an important Yes. That's an important change. Yes. What, uh, I mean, by the end of the 60s, this, a lot of this, I mean, even though the programs keep going, a lot of the funding, a lot of the national commitment to both civil rights and to po anti-poverty programs uh, begins to fade, and the new, new president come, comes in with the war in Vietnam, and uh, the black power movement that changes things. How, how did, uh, how did you feel about the kind of it by the end of the sixties? What? Well, I felt that uh, the reasoning for the lessening of financial assistance from <clears throat> from Ford and Ford Incorporated mm -hmm. from from uh, the various foundations, mm -hmm. to some degree, was predicated on the fact that they felt that that the overt racism that we started out fighting to, had been to some degree overcome. Uh, for instance, there was, by then, there was no more water fountains saying black and white. There were no more there were few, if any, hotels that refused to to accept people because of ethnic differences. And really, as we see often, and right now, it's, it's more difficult to check out of a hotel than it is to check in. <laughs> you know, uh, the the issue of segregation sports events is no longer uh, the requirement, mm -hmm. and to some degree, uh, the assistance of the foundation world had participated greatly in causing these kinds of difficulties to, to be no more. So the, then there was the activity on the part of some old and young blacks 
who felt that there needed to be as much emphasis on human relations in areas outside of the South as in the South. And when there began to be a move to do the kinds of things we were doing in the South, in areas in the North where racism was just as bad, uh, that's when the white establishment that controls the finances of this nation began to to to, to pull back. Mm -hmm. uh, the that failure to continue to to participate brought down brought down the financial opportunity of most of the civil rights organizations that depend on on uh, the arms given. Now, prior to 1964, 1974, prior to 1974, in Mississippi we had support from the National Office of NACP that provided a field director to do much of the work that's being done. But since 1974, we have not had a single paid employee. All of us who are involved do it because we're interested and determined that the conditions which we see need to be overcome, mm. that we do what we can to mm -hmm. overcome. Mm. Uh, when, we, when we look at the, the uh, movement toward integration of the North. And I tell you one thing that had, that still has a profound legitimizing effort in those who want to look at the whole nation. In Lerone Bennett's book, Before the Mayflower, I hope you've seen it, he takes the position, and of course, Before the Mayflower probably came off in around 1964, 65, mm -hmm. somewhere around there. But in, in that, uh, it's not necessarily a book of sequential facts, but in in his review in in uh, before the Mayflower, there has never been in the history of this nation. I'm talking about New York, North Carolina. Where are you from? California. California, Mississippi, nowhere. Has a white person been required to pay with their life? a crime against the black, not one. No way. Tennessee either. Mm -hmm. More than 18,000 blacks have paid with their lives for crimes against whites. But not a single white in this nation has ever paid with their life for a crime against a black. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those who, who began to look at racial improvement as hypocritical based on the fact that if you're from New York or if you're from California, you're from wherever, that there is an ipso facto that uh, your involvement in human relations is better than it is down here is not necessarily so. Mm -hmm. Now, I would guess I travel about 100,000 miles a year somewhere. Uh, I got to go up somewhere, Chile, Chile, Hule, Oregon, uh, on the twenty-first, <laughs> on the twenty-first of January, to do the Martin Luther King thing. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, like I say, I've been I go, go wherever I can uh -huh. when I'm asked. But I feel just as comfortable in North Carolina, or Florida, uh -huh. as I do in Wisconsin or wherever. Uh, where you are is a reflection. For the people you meet, and that, that that don't make no difference where you are. Mm -hmm. You are as comfortable or as uncomfortable when the people that you are with, and who who you have in terms of, of a presence, the, 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 those who surround you, whether you feel comfortable or uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and that ain't got nothing to do with where you are. Mm -hmm.
when uh, you drive around Mississippi in the south, even though those that aspect of things have changed a lot, there's still, uh, I mean, a lot of the things that you spend a lot of your life fighting for, particularly things around economic development and, and educational opportunities. Suffrage. Suffrage and stuff, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's still, we still have a long ways to Oh, go. yes, oh, yes. It's and, not nearly done. Yeah. And I, I wonder what kind of, uh, if you're uh, communicate as you go out and talk to groups of students and young people and stuff, uh, and try to and talk to them about specific, fairly specific strategies for trying to deal with some of the economic and the social and political problems in the country. What what kind of lessons are you drawing from your your really lifetime of, of, of working and struggling around these issues? What are, what are you telling today? Well, I, I believe that, that that your basic that your basic opportunity of overcoming the problems you face really on a personal level is the best way to, to deal with that is to secure as much education as you can. I think that when you have the opportunity of uh, being able to harness that monster in, in terms of the educational appetite that you are able to to synthesize what it is you all do or what it is you all not do. Uh, I, I, I certainly think that that uh, the the necessity of being willing to first accept everybody you meet as a good person and let their actions determine whether that justification is good or bad. Uh, the, give, every, give every person the first opportunity to be as, as decent as you would want them to be or as decent as you think you know you are yourself. And if you find somewhere down the line that, that you made a mistake then let it be because of what that person does or does not do. That's a part of what you consider your ethnic uh, back, background ought to be. Whether you continue to have them as an acquaintance or a friend or whatever you want to. I would say those are really two of the basic things that mm -hmm. I think. You know, well, education, mm -hmm. certainly, number one, and the, the, the ability to synthesize mm -hmm. uh, the activities of whoever it is that you have re established a relationship with, but give everybody the first chance to be mm -hmm. what you would hope that they are. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, in terms of, uh, of how people come together and what kind of strategies uh, they employ, whether it's, you know, new moral poverty, uh, Kind of mass organizations or something. Do you have? Do you have? Yeah, I, I, think, you think, of yeah, the, I think. as long as you as people. long as you conduct yourself uh, within the legalities of the First Amendment of this nation, mm -hmm. I can certainly. While I might not agree with what you do, I'll go way back to the old philosophy of agreeing with your right to do it. I, I don't think that we resolve any problem by violating the law to do it. I think that there are many ways that when there is a, an action taken that we disagree with, there are many ways we can redress that uh, action without ourselves violating the law to do it. And uh, I, I certainly believe in, in the demonstration, I believe in confrontation, mm -hmm. I believe in calling you alive, you're telling me more. Mm -hmm. Uh, whatever the the uh, reaction ought be, but when it comes to to uh, throwing bricks and setting fires and and uh, causing physical harm and and uh, you know again violating the law in this way, mm -hmm. I, I would think it uh, creates more problems than it solves, and it certainly mm -hmm. is not in my repertoire mm -hmm. of of uh, 
ammunitions mm -hmm. to overcome the problems we face. Mm -hmm. What about, uh, I was kind of thinking right here about, <coughs> I mean, another issue, in, particularly in the South, is, is how do you generate economic growth and economic development in, these, in rural areas? Well, you I, see things that are working or not? Well, I would like to see see uh, a budgetary mind, you know, set for whatever your your income is to adjust to to you know being able to live within it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that that it requires nearly as much money as we all spend in order to, yeah. to, to, to deal with life in, in a way uh, that's uh, comfortable, you know, to us. I, I, I'd like to spend more, more money than I do, but I also know that uh, I, I spend too much sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, doing things that I ought not to be, you know, really engaged in or involved in. Mm -hmm. So the the minimum wage thing certainly is too little but having to to earn two hundred thousand dollars a year you know doesn't have to be mm. there are ways of of adjusting yourself to to live within what you make i would say anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a year mm. anybody ought to be able to exist in that. Mm -hmm. So do you uh, feel hopeful then about things in the south, in the rural south? And the, say well, you, yeah, you if I didn't it, feel you know. hopeful that we could overcome the problems that we face, and when I see some opportunity of legislation in the Congress, like the Delta Bill was uh, introduced to uh, by Whitten and SP mm -hmm. uh, last year to, to try to deal with some of the problems and the study that it got and uh, certainly that's a little bit of hope but uh, you, there is a faith in in the in your belief that people will do right if they know what's right mm -hmm. and of course there's always the the, the opportunity of, of taking a position that you, your Christian faith will, you know, see you through. Mm -hmm. So were it not for those two opportunities of belief that things can be better and feeling sure because of them that things could, could get better, I'm sure it would be a, be a, a, a very, shall we say, sad and, and uh, almost... Uh, a living that one could not really cope with, mm -hmm. because if, if what you saw was all you could expect to ever see. Mm -hmm. have, have our churches made progress? I would say in some areas, yeah, but the one area that they have not made progress is in human relations. Mm -hmm. And it's important for the nation, really, for the more moral fiber which pretty well all of us feel is concentrated in the churches, for it to be so far out front of doing things that are right because they're right and treating people of different ethnic backgrounds uh, with full respect and dignity, uh, that the other institutions would feel a compelling determination to follow. But uh, right now, the church is not ahead at all. The church is right now. What about the political structure? I mean, you've been in state politics, and I mean, that's something that's changed remarkably in Mississippi. Yeah, well, yes. I remember 1963 that January, Meg and I were both escorted out of the the balcony of Mississippi's legislature, you know, you got no business here. Mm -hmm. Didn't even look at it. Didn't even look at the monkey's play. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, today there, well, right now there are twenty five of us, and most likely in you know January there'll be forty three. That's a major. Mm -hmm. And you've had been able to have an effect on the type of legislation and the. Uh, yeah, but one thing I haven't been able to get nothing done on. Uh, that's the the uh, structure of the Mississippi state flag. Mm -hmm. You see, we have uh, the, the the residue of the Confederate flag in the coffin corner mm -hmm. of our state flag. And that Confederate flag is the banner under which white males marched under to keep my grandma and my grandpa in slavery. Mm -hmm. That was what they were advocating when they marched beneath that flag, let's keep slavery going. The soldiers who did not march under that banner were trying to remove slavery as an institution from this nation. And why we want to keep that insulting symbol waving in the eyes of, of certainly everybody who who has who all the people who have negatives about it is uh, a thing that ought not be done. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are, there are still four states that were you know it, it, we said some of us said fifteen, some said eleven. I would look at it uh, states that fought mm -hmm. for the retention mm -hmm. of slavery. There are only four now mm -hmm. that uh, still have that emblem in the flag. Mm -hmm. It's South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And I, I will keep on <laughs> trying to get that residue out of the state flag mm -hmm. uh, as long as I can have a voice. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in trying to do it. I just think it's absurd. It's, it, uh, anybody who reads the history of the Confederate flag know why it's there, mm -hmm. know how it came about, uh, and how we can still be proud of the fact that my grandma and my grandma was held in slavery by your grandma and your grandpa mm -hmm. uh, is, is a thing that Maybe if I, if, if I was uh, of the Caucasian ethnic, I could accept it, but I just can't. Just. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why you've been still trying to get that. Yeah, I, I've, I've I introduce it every year, and I'll go on the floor. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll do it again next year. And catch her, oh Lord, here come a lecture about my grandpa. <laughs> They've heard it. Oh, oh yeah. Well, they need to hear it again. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's, yeah, that's terrific.